Yabba dabba do! <laughs> Homo sapiens didn't travel the journey of evolution alone millions of years ago. Eight other known human species were part of the race to become the most intelligent and dominant species on the planet. However, only one of them was perhaps both friends and foes to the modern human, the Neanderthals. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we are looking back way beyond history in prehistoric times to find out what life was like for Neanderthal. A Neanderthal's search for meaning of life. Say hello to our slightly little relatives, H. Neanderthalensis, or Neanderthals for short, who dominated Europe and Western Asia during the last 200,000 years of the Ice Age before Homo sapiens stepped out of Africa. They slept on the animal rugs and, contrary to popular belief, were quite social and preferred a family life than just meeting random women. I mean, they had standards. The Eurasian steppes are not quite rich in nutritional vegetables, but they had nuts, fruits, roots, and mushrooms. Speaking of mushrooms, of course we have to talk about what kind of mushrooms they were having. Apart from native European pasture land mushrooms that are generally harmless, Neanderthals were also consuming psychoactive plant produce like chamomile and yarrow about 50,000 years ago. A burial site in Menorca, Spain offered a variety of alkaloid substances that were byproducts of the nightshade plant such as well-known stimulant ephedrine, along with scopalamine and atropine that can cause out-of-body experiences along with hallucinations. This particular cave was also decorated with boxes patterned with art that seems possibly made under the influence. Does that mean the Neanderthals were just chill dudes who faded with time like the wild leaves they smoked? The experts don't really think so. Yeah, Neanderthals were capable of not only lighting fire for cooking and heat, but they were able to use it adeptly for defense and hunting too. But when it comes to using psychedelics and stimulants, the Neanderthals differed in practice. Their consumption of psychoactive plants wasn't recreational, it was spiritual. Like many ancient religions, they considered these plants as a means to reach the supernatural in higher dimensions and find existential meaning. It's quite possible that the Neanderthals were responsible for inventing religions as we know them. They loved seafood. While most Neanderthals stuck to the grasslands of European steppes, some ventured further toward seas like the remains of Neanderthals found in the Iberian Peninsula, specifically modern Portugal, and they were quite adventurous with their marine menu. The cave of Figuera Brava near Stubal showed evidence of Neanderthals living there nearly a hundred thousand years ago. They were consuming fish, mussels, crabs, eels, seabirds, seals, and dolphins, and they were even gutsy enough to hunt sharks. Sharks! The diet of Figuera cave Neanderthals was 50% seafood, and the rest was composed of terrestrial animals like deer, goats, horses, aurochs, and tortoises. Wow, these folks could eat anything they could get their hands on. Let's not even imagine what they would have done if they had met more of their kind or perhaps other species like Homo sapiens. And it wasn't just about what they could get their hands on. They were proficient hunters who learned new techniques and skills to get what they wanted to eat. We Homo sapiens just developed apps so we can get whatever we want on our couches. The shells found in Italy suggest that the Neanderthals living at Grotta de Moscerini in the Latium region were using shells to make sharp tools as far as 90,000 years ago that they employed for hunting. While most of these shell tools were made of the seashells found at the seashores, try saying that five times, interestingly, there were like 25% of them that had shells with smooth exterior, no wear or tear, and a glossy lacquer that could only be found at the seabed with live clams in them. That means some Neanderthals were capable of sea diving. The northern part of the Adriatic offers some sandbanks where Kalista clams can be collected at shallow seabeds that are only a meter deep and clams can be caught there by simply waiting. But archaeologists have found enough evidence to claim some Neanderthals dared to venture as deep as four meters under the sea and they did so without any proper scuba equipment. Well, as far as we know, because no such gear has been excavated. But what if they did invent some crazy primitive technology to breathe underwater to hunt sharks and chase turtles? Well. Only time will tell if we find any such evidence. Until then, we can say we have Scrodinger scuba diving Neanderthal, I guess. Meanwhile, the Neanderthals of Belgian steppes were using projectile weapons such as spears and slings to hunt rhinos and mouflon sheep. Neanderthals were low-key bad at... Well, you know what I'm saying. Cooking with Neanderthals We have already established that Neanderthals were well capable of controlling and producing fire. 
Fire was, has, and will be an important part of cooking, even though now it is getting fierce competition from microwaves or air fryers. The majority of the world is still dependent on good old flames to cook their dinners. While Neanderthals of Portugal loved eating anything from mussels to sharks, their primary staple food appears to be brown crabs. Crabs, like the rest of the seafood, are rich in omega-3 fatty acids that also have played an important function in the brain growth of Homo sapiens in Africa, or else we wouldn't be here. Brown crabs were preferred by the Neanderthals for a very simple reason, the size. Adult brown crabs have a shell or carapace that would provide them about 200 grams, about seven ounces of meat per adult brown crab. The stretch marks and injury patterns suggest that the Neanderthals used stone tools to crack the shells of the brown crabs. Now these marks were complemented by black burns on many shells found from that era, suggesting that the Neanderthals preferred to roast the crabs over hot coals at a temperature of 300 to 500 degrees Celsius, and then they cracked those puppies open to enjoy the primitive delicacy. Mmm. If the Neanderthals of the Iberian and Apennine Peninsula were masters of barbecued seafoods, the findings in Shanidar Cave in Iraq's Zagros Mountains and Franthi Cave in Greece have shown that Neanderthals meant business when they cooked food. The 70,000 years old and stale remains of the Neanderthals' cuisine at Shanidar Cave show that the people we perceive as cavemen were more than just stocky and burly oafs who would consume large quantities of game meat. They were known to create proper recipes by combining pulses or lentils with wild nuts, various kinds of grasses, wild mustards, and herbs. They also incorporated various cooking techniques to make food more palatable, such as grinding certain ingredients to paste, soaking lentils and pulses to make them easy to swallow, and pounding and shredding herbs to create powders and smaller, easily consumable pieces. It is also evident that the Neanderthals from everywhere they existed were knowledgeable enough to consume barks of poplar and hot water for pain relievers, the same tree that is now the source of components used to make aspirin. They also administered doses of moles of penicillium for wounds and scratches. It took us tens of thousands of years to recognize and manufacture the first antibiotic from it. The Neanderthals were a tight-knit community most of the time, with families taking care of young and elders. We still have to discover a lot more to paint a picture of what a Neanderthal family's dinner looked like, but we can at least dive deep into what the mechanics were as a family. Bonding like a Neanderthal. Perhaps the most well-known depiction of a Neanderthal family in popular culture comes from the animated movie Ice Age, where a small tribe of Homo neanderthalensis has to travel but is aching for the loss of their small child. It comes down to our three most unlikely heroes in the form of a mammoth, a sloth, and a reformed Siberian tiger to help the kid reunite with her folks while they endure the challenges of a ruthless, you guessed it, Ice Age. But were Neanderthals that caring about their kids? The answer is probably more than what we saw in that movie. It seems Neanderthals strongly believe that nobody gets left behind policy. The Neanderthals lived in small communities in caves, traveling through river valleys to hunt bison, ibex, and horses in the steppes. Women moved from community to community more frequently than men in search of mates. Interestingly, Neanderthal infants had a similar head size to a head of a Homo sapiens infant, only shaped differently and followed a distinct growth pattern. The families most likely lived together, hunted together, dined together, and took care of their needy members. A middle-aged skeleton found in the Shanidar cave had an amputated arm, a fractured leg, and multiple additional injuries that also showed signs of healing and treatment. The Neanderthal to whom the skeleton belonged wasn't abandoned, but taken care of till their last breath, it seems. The kids also contributed to society by grouping and foraging while they played and learned the necessary skills to survive a hostile environment. Most modern depictions of the Neanderthal show them making low grunts, but the truth was perhaps far from it. We don't know if the Neanderthals spoke a language or maybe more than one language, but communication must have played a crucial part in their survival as a community. Like humans, the Neanderthals had a bone called the hyoid. This bone is the magic key that is a major distinction between us and the apes, and it allows humans to speak, so it is safe to assume that perhaps Neanderthals could speak too if they invented a language. If not, at least this much is certain that they would have had high-pitched voices instead of guttural sounds. How they got the ladies' attention. It is believed that males impress women with prize hunts and loud shouts to mate and form a bond. The males averaged about five feet five inches in height and women were around five feet two. They were around for 350,000 years in Eurasia and vanished around 40,000 years ago. Coincidentally, at the same time, the Homo sapiens arrived in that region. 
Some believe they are gone because of the interspecies wars. Others claim it was interbreeding with humans that eliminated their genes. Yet many people across the globe carry their genes in them. Genome sequencing studies have suggested that Neanderthals reproduced with early humans during the Ice Age. However, modern humans do not have any Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. This DNA can only be passed down by mothers, suggesting that only the mating of a female human and a male Neanderthal could produce viable offspring with the ability to reproduce. And that would explain a lot. Their DNA contributed to boosted immune functioning. For example, some Neanderthal genes are thought to have contributed to the composition of the brain, muscle contraction, and body fat distribution. Some negative traits were brought about by Neanderthal DNA, including diabetes, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, allergies to pollen and animal fur, excessive blood clotting, and major depressive disorder. Thanks for watching yet another interesting and nutty video from Nutty History. If you like the video, please share, subscribe, comment, and leave a like. I'll see you next time.